Rosenberg. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, you know, it's such a pleasure um, to be on um, this podcast. Absolutely mutual. Thank you, Ross. Let's start with self-love because when you're talking about self-love recovery, that initially it sounds like, okay, that's a wonderful ideal, but how do you, how do you make that happen? How do you get someone to a place of self-love recovery? Well, um, that's a really difficult question that I'm going to answer one. I'm going to, I'm going to have to give you a backstory and then I'll answer the question. Um, I love it. So I wrote the book, the human magnet syndrome, um, six years ago. And I was really not a fan, even back then, to the idea of codependency. I just did not like it. Uh, it was such a negative, pejorative, and um, stigmatizing um, um, concept. And I knew that I was going to eventually replace it. Um, what I did with my first book was I actually redefined codependency to make it more uh, of a mental health clinical psychological term. And one day it hit me, it's self-love deficit disorder. The unifying fact for all people who b believe they're codependent is an absence of self-love that um, is connected to core shame, loneliness, and trauma that we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. so once I came up with the term self-love deficit disorder, um, I tried it out among my clients and I, and I was just curious on what codependent folks, people who identify themselves with codependency thought about it. And it kind of had this paradoxical impact because, you know, it went from this word that kind of meant nothing to something that had disorder in it. And they all liked it because it, they recognized it as themselves. They felt and always have known this, this wave of self-love deficit in their life. And then once, and after about three or four months in developing the ideas and the concepts on what I now call SLDD, which is the replacement term for, uh, for codependency, self-love deficit disorder, I thought to myself, I don't really like the fact that it's so negative. What happens when someone solves it or resolves it? I don't like the idea of calling someone a recovering SLDD because in the codependency literature, so, and they, um, they liken it to an addiction. So you're a codependent, and then when you're doing well, you're a recovering codependent. And that's when I came up with the obvious solution, and I called it self-love abundance. Mm. So a codependent or someone with self-love deficit disorder, an SLD, someone who's self-love deficient, um, when they resolve the underlying causes of their disorder, which is trauma, core shame, loneliness, and they make progress according to mm. a, what I have developed is a 10-stage SLDD recovery program, which I now call self-love recovery. That is how they resolve the underlying problems that are responsible for the disorder and they experience self-love. So the short answer, Michael, Yep. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought this was the short answer. It actually is. But the, <laughs> but the short answer of the short, um, the short answer is that you reach self-love by tracing back its origins and solving it at its roots. Mm. And there is no way that a person can ever find self-love or recover from self-love deficit disorder if they don't resolve the attachment trauma that caused it. This is why in my new book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, um, I say codependency therapy has never really worked because it's nothing, well, it's nothing short of Band-Aid therapy because these folks are deeply traumatized in a way that they're not only um, unconscious about it, um, they're not able to solve it. And it takes a therapist that can trace back its origins, which is the trauma of the origins of the self-love deficit disorder and resolve it. So it's a long um, and sometimes difficult path, but I've seen so many people um, um, make remarkable, remarkable uh, changes in their life you know, for the better. 
I know that there are a lot of people who have resistance to therapy, that they think that all psychotherapists are just quacks or that this is just confusion and that you're making problems. But one of your metaphors that for me helps to cut through a lot of that criticism is this metaphor of the trauma fossil. Right. You know, Can you unpack that for us? The trauma fossil, well, actually the trauma fossil follows my, um, my explanation of what I call paleon psychotherapy. Um, when, I, when I was a little boy, I dreamt of being um, um, a paleontologist to find dinosaurs. And it's funny how um, later I would um, turn that childhood fascination into what I do as a psychotherapist. So if, if we understand that um, self-love deficit disorder is caused by attachment trauma, and we also understand that it is um, placed in the part of our mind, just like any other form of post-traumatic stress disorder, where we cannot remember, don't want to remember. Uh, we call that repression. So it's represented unconsciously in another part of our brain. Um, therefore, the person who is the trauma survivor or who has been victimized by it, um, they don't know what happened. And so when I am working with an SLD, it's not as easy as, as saying, so what happened when you were a child? Because mm. most of them cannot recall it. And if they could, there is a countervailing force in their brain that says, no freaking way, I'm not going to let you remember it. Mm. And that really is textbook trauma theory. So to help my clients figure out what happened, it's, I came up with this metaphor that we have to dig one layer at a time um, and every layer represents um, li a linear representation of where they are. It's that linear representation of trauma and you're going to find fragments at every level. And so being a wannabe paleontologist, mm -hmm. I call them trauma fossils, that the trauma is not you know, we think about a dinosaur, um, the dinosaur, it's not that all the bones are going to be in one area, they're going to be spread out um, through um, a variety of areas. And, and, and the job of the paleontologist is to take each fossil that in itself might not tell you what's going on, but have one fossil, lead, dig some more, find the other fossil, and one fragment at a time, put them together and once you get the whole um, set of fragments, you can understand the trauma. Mm -hmm. In every layer, you go deeper, you find more um, trauma fossils, and then you're going to get to the layer of when it all happened. And that's when you can understand this trauma and metaphorically take it from the unconscious mind um, where um, – it's not safe to remember, to integrate it to the conscious mind and take that fossil. And as they do, and some of my favorite, uh, and, and I love when I see these reconstructions of dinosaurs or reconstructions of paleo, paleo uh, Neanderthal man, mm. you can see exactly what happened. And then there's the story. Mm. And to me, that connects paleontology to trauma resolution. We, we put together the trauma fragments and we help a person understand the story, what happened to them. And when they can see it, they can integrate it and it's no longer needed. It, the mind no longer has to fight so hard to keep it repressed. That's so fascinating. Let's, uh, okay, so let's, let's build one more metaphor here out of your trauma fossils because I love this, that there's like these radioactive uh forces that are kind of, or these radioactive pulses coming out from the trauma fossils mm -hmm. so in a similar way in a in a traumatized brain it's like that trauma is is giving off this repeated ghosting signal that um by ghosting i mean that uh the original signal keeps echoing mm -hmm. but there's these like these these ghosted echoes of that trauma that just break through the mind at spontaneous times and cause these spikes in depression and anxiety. That that's, that that's what a PTSD person's life is like if they've got, yeah, if they've got post-traumatic stress disorder, that 
from the hippocampus, from the memory, this trauma ghost spontaneously just breaks through and keeps haunting their conscious life. Do you see in your work a correlation with the way that trauma and PTSD affect the mind that you think that, yeah, this, this whole like metaphor of a ghost springing out of the hippocampus and haunting the mind from your side of view, from your point of view on the clinical side, does that, you know, biopoetic framing of a trauma ghost that, you know, comes out of the hippocampus and haunts the, the mind, does that fit in with what you see in the clinic? This is why I just, I just love talking to you, Michael, because um, you bring a scientific explanation to some of these ideas that I've been working with. And um, it's just wonderful to know that there's science behind it. So I have this concept that I call um, the, um, the wounded child. And so the way that I um, conceptualize attachment trauma is similar to um, the way you conceptualize this wounded ghost. Or what, was that what you call it? The trauma ghost. The trauma ghost. Is that the trauma is stored in another part of our brain that we cannot access directly. And as we understand with PTSD, there's leakage. And that leakage comes to us in all sorts of forms. And I'd like to think that that leakage comes um, in the form of you, what you would call the trauma ghost. What I teach my clients is that when we experience what you call the trauma ghost, we are experiencing that child they used to be at the point of their trauma who they cannot access through memory they can only access through um, body sensations, feelings, um, mm. um, through um, bits of memory. And as my clients move towards self-love recovery and we start to um, integrate the trauma memories, more of this comes back. And so this trauma ghost that you're talking about really is, it's a, it's a perfect uh, metaphor, is... Um, a great representation of either fragments of the PTSD um, trauma, the trauma locked away in the brain's um, 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 in the limbic system. So yes, we actually are talking about the same thing. Your trauma ghost is the same thing as the trauma child. They deliver messages that we can't normally get to um, because those memories are offline and not available to us. Mm, that's fascinating that we have to discern them through intuition and through sensitive impulses as opposed to through direct imagination or direct intellect. Um, and, if, and, if, and when that's where psychotherapy is so important, because of my own psychotherapy, if I all of a sudden get a tightness in my stomach or I get angry at someone, I know using your terminology I'm connecting to my trauma ghost mm. that comes from my own childhood and my own attachment trauma. And the healthier we get, the more we can identify this trauma ghost and, and be more compassionate and, and patient with ourselves and deescalate the somatic or the body responses. Oh man, Russ, you're making me want to geek out and dive deeper into the brain, but I want to, <laughs> I want to spare our listeners for now, but I just have to like blurt out the words like subiculum, parasubiculum. So, so bring this back into the topic of transformation because I, I want to, to say that what you're doing and the work that you're doing as a psychotherapist to transform the innermost part of a person's being is like what in the medieval period that the alchemists were doing when they were trying to take the base metal lead and find a way to transform it into gold. The, what I feel like you do in your work is to, to do alchemy on humans Perfect. and to take them from this, this lead state of self-love deficit and to guide them toward this self-love abundance where they have this shining golden you know, aura. I say aura you know, poetically here. I've obviously got to, always got to clarify. <laughs> but then they've got this, this luminosity about them. And that's, you know, when I talk about the luminous brain, that's what I'm talking about. The state of eudaimonia, of self-love abundance, where you're being your best actualized self. Well, you know, I, I don't believe that there are many things that are purely coincidental. And one of the most um, 
um, life-changing books that I've ever read was called The Alchemist by uh, Paolo Coelho. Um, and um, just wanted to throw that out there. Mm. But with regard to the metaphor alchemy, um, it's interesting because I have, a, I have a, a, a take on it. So alchemists try to find how to take one ingredient, one metal, and make something else. And they never succeeded because it wasn't possible. And they just didn't have the science to realize that the 500 years or 1,000 years of trying, maybe longer, trying to turn lead into gold or whatever they were trying to do, it wasn't possible. So alchemy in its theoretical stage is how to take something that never was meant to be gold into gold. Um, I'd like to add just a, a different element to your alchemy metaphor. It's understanding that you can't ever find self-love. You can't take lead and turn it into gold by this simple bunch of solutions or experiments. It requires a fundamental reorganization of everything you know and everything you believe and to come to understand that the old way will never work just like alchemy never turned it into gold and to find the way to actually turn your heart and i think of the grinch <laughs> still christmas that was made out of coal is as coal um, was um you know plants and um Everything changes into something, but is to take coal to turn it into a diamond. See, that is the alchemy that you're talking about. This type of alchemy is taking an ingredient, a constituent ingredient, and turning it into what it is possible to be. The, the, and, and that is the gold, the self-love. Trauma can be self-love if you follow the right ingredients. Yeah. The right recipe i should say i love the way that you're nuancing this metaphor ross because this actually goes back to eric erickson that you're saying that alchemy was taking something and trying to to make it deviate from its natural potential whereas with human development we're trying to take an individual and make them actualize their inborn potential. So it's not changing their nature, it's actualizing their highest potential. Ross, thank you so much for being on our show. This has been a real pleasure and a real illuminating experience to be able to talk with you. Um, let me know when the next time you want me on because uh, not only um, um, am I grateful for the opportunity to uh, be a part of your podcast, but I think that uh, you and I have this um, very cool synergy going on um, and the more I talk to you, the more ideas that I have. So I appreciate that. Um, and then if I may, I'd like to do some, uh, a little bit of self-promotion. Um, I'd like your um, viewers and listeners to consider uh, purchasing my new book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, The Codependent Narcissist Trap. It can be purchased at selflovecovery.com or at Amazon.